Welcome into the KSO Sunday Show. Mason both KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway here with you. And we come after another one-on-one week for K-State. Feels like we've said that a lot this season. Uh, it's better than the weeks in the middle where we were saying another 0-2 week for K-State and we weren't really enjoying talking basketball. But I think there's some life and also there's always just a reinvigoration of people's spirits for basketball when the conference tournament comes around. Because it's a little bit like when Major League Baseball season starts, and you're like, well, could be our year. Everybody has a chance. Like You get that eternal optimism going. These conference tournaments provide it because everybody talks themselves into, we could be that team that gets hot because of this, this, and this. Um, you could also be the team that is not because of this, this, and this. But uh, I spent plenty of time, two years, it was long enough, uh, covering Wichita State. And it seems like every year they were just like, well, you know, things could break the right way and the Shockers could turn it on. It's like, eh, I don't know. They haven't really showed us that they're going to turn it on at any point uh, this year, which them losing at Tulane on Friday night, I don't think they're going to turn anything on this season. So way to go, Wichita State. But K-State, they got a big win yesterday against Iowa State, and they take down the number six cycle in 65-58 to 58 in Manhattan. And there's a whole number of things that we can hit on on this. K-State gets the win that you know keeps those hopes alive for maybe an NCAA tournament backdoor spot. And we look at the numbers in this game. There are a lot of things that stick out, and a lot of it being themes that we talked about throughout the season. You got two of the big three to play amazing games, and it's two of the guys that over the last few weeks have been very disappointing. David Gasson steps up, and we talked about why K-State was so good early in Big 12 play. He was a key contributor but then the scoring and the rebounding had disappeared until recently. He was big. K-State still turned the ball over. They also forced Iowa State to turn the ball over. And then K-State got to the free throw line more than Iowa State. So I'll start with Fan. What were the general takeaways from what K-State did yesterday? And how much of that win is a credit to K-State versus Iowa State laying a gigantic egg? Yeah, it's. I mean, you could probably say it's a little bit of both. I think... Iowa State kind of played their game the first 10 to 13 minutes or so. They were up 18 to 10, uh, forcing turnovers. And then it kind of flipped. I, you know, and I, in many ways, we kind of out Iowa Stated Iowa State from the rest of the game. I mean, uh, they're, they're not a great team at taking care of the ball. That, well, they actually, they have been a pretty good team at taking care of the ball. But against us in both games, they were not. And, and really, that was – Maybe the biggest factor in this game is is K State was pretty much even in turnovers, fifteen to fourteen, but K State took advantage of them. The twenty to eleven points off turnover gap was not something you expected to see. Iowa State is usually the team that's scoring 20, 25 points off turnovers when they beat people, um, so that was big. I think you mentioned the other two free throws uh, was a big one. Both teams were pretty poor from three, all, both around twenty nine percent. So. That really wasn't a difference maker in this game. Uh, and then, you know, K-State won on the boards, too. That was a big one. 39-27 uh, or 36-27. They had more offense rebounds. They won offense rebounding rate. And they won second chances, 10-7. to So you look at a game where, where K-State, you know, struggled early, uh, fought and built a, a pretty good lead with, with I think, a 33-8 to run between the first and second half. Uh, and that, you know, that's kind of one of the keys that we've talked about. Um, the keys to winning games, because you almost know every team's going to go on a run, is to build your lead big enough that you can absorb the run. And that's what K-State did. Iowa State did go on a 10-0 run, cut it to five. And they kind of made it sort of close in the last minute, cutting it to five. But really, once K-State built it back up to 11 points in the final three or four minutes, the game was over and, and – uh, K-State did enough to win and and got a, another top 10 AP win, another quad 1A win. So it's a big resume point for them. Yeah, it, K-State kind of took it to Iowa State there for a little bit, getting the lead up to 17. And I think that's something that like all of us were just kind of in shock of is when, when the lead really ballooned. Because I, I think that if you would have told – all three of us, like one one team is going to go up seventeen. I don't think that anybody would have said that K State would be that team uh, yesterday. But it, it's when you get to the free throw line, twenty one times, and you make fourteen. And the other team only shoots fifteen total. It, it's it's pretty easy to to win the game. 
And even though you didn't shoot well, you still made two more threes in Iowa State. So, that, I mean, that's a six-point difference, and you won by seven. But it, it, it's an easy game when K-State makes shots. And the first probably five, six minutes, they were getting good looks, didn't make shots. The rest of the game, it's it seemed like when they were open, for the most part, they were making it. So and it, another thing I'll throw in there real quick is K-State killed on the offensive glass all season. They out-rebounded Iowa State. Yes. on the offensive boards and mm -hmm. Jerome Tang also talked about second chance points and points off turnovers in this game because they forced turnovers and aims but they didn't get points off of it yesterday they they capitalized on that and that's another big factor something that they've struggled with for a lot of the season now yeah and I mean you're you're getting good games from Tyler Perry and Arthur or uh, by uh, Cam Carter and Arthur Kluma you want more from Tyler Perry but if you get two of the three to score 20 points, it's really hard for this team to lose to somebody. So it doesn't really matter who two of the three are, as long as two of the three play well. Yeah, yeah. the other thing I'd add in there, you mentioned the turnovers. Uh, fast break points was 15-2 to two as well for K-State. So another thing, K-State, uh, a key against Iowa State is to score before they set up their defense. And, and you know, getting 15 points in transition is a, is a good way to do that. So. Uh, that was another factor because Iowa State's defense still is really good. I mean, K State was still under one uh, one point per possession for the game, 0.98, but they held to Iowa State to 0.87, which was their worst offensive game this year. So, uh, one of K State's best defense, not their best defensive game, but one of their best. But to hold Iowa State, who's really an average offense, I think that you know that's another discussion. I think that will be something to watch in March for them. Uh, but to hold them to their worst offensive game was was still pretty impressive. Drew brought this up after the game, so there are a couple of things here uh, that, that we'll bring up if it's going to be something that can be replicated and continue. First, there are two good things, what we saw out of Kaluma and Carter. And for Cam Carter, I will say, as much as there has been a lot of bad the last couple of weeks, the last few games his shooting was getting better. He was starting to knock down a couple more threes for this team. The turnovers still really high, but he came through. Arthur Kaluma was aggressive to start in the KU game. Then that game got away from him and everybody else, but was good yesterday. The one bad Tyler Perry back-to-back -back bad games didn't shoot well yesterday. Did hit a big one late though that mattered. The the concerning thing though was probably the six turnovers, which I would say at times uh, I'm you know I'm not trying to be the guy that doesn't put too much hate on Tyler Perry, but uh, sometimes I think those turnovers are created by what his teammates are doing, not what he is doing. So the three things we saw from the three stars yesterday for K-State, are those replicable in a good way or a bad way? I mean, I think that they're replicable. I mean, we've seen it at times this season where K-State has gotten 20 from two of the three. The, the hope is still that eventually that you'll get all three of them with 15 or more because we just haven't seen that too often this year. The only real concerning thing with Tyler Perry for me is that after he went on that like scorching two weeks that both of the games this week, he was two of 13 from three. He did hit, he did, he did hit a huge one yesterday, but you'd still like to see him get back into the efficient Tyler Perry that we saw when he went six of eight against Cincinnati and even six of 11 against West Virginia. Yeah. That, I mean, that's maybe your biggest concern that, that he probably had his two worst games in Big 12 play the last two games, Tyler Perry, that is. And um, hopefully he can break out of that funk in Kansas City. Um, I think Drew's right. As, as long as you can get two of those three going, that's a good thing. Um, and that's one thing about playing Texas. I know we'll talk about this more later. Texas is, you know, a semi-average defensive team in the league and over the course of the season. So um, you're playing a team that's probably better on offense and defense. Uh, so hopefully that can factor in. Although K-State was very poor on offense in Austin, so um, that's going to be something to, to watch uh, going forward. But uh, you do need I, – I think you can replicate having two of those three play well. I think we've had two of those three play fairly well in three out of the last five games. Um, just uh, both of those other ones were on the road against Cincinnati and KU, two pretty good defensive teams. So um, hopefully that trend does not continue. Uh, we only – we really didn't have any of them play very well against Texas, although uh, uh, Kaluma had 17 points, but it wasn't a super efficient 17. So um, that's going to factor in. Hopefully those those guys um, are a little bit motivated by that going into the Big 12 tournament. 
and then just we'll see uh, what kind of pressure do they play on in Kansas City, and and is that going to be a factor? Because I it could be. I think we've seen this team under pressure struggle, uh, but you know Saturday was obviously a pressure game too, and and two of them thrive. So it's just hard to say. You just never know with this team this year. Um, that's why we're on the bubble. That's why we have 13 losses. So uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I wonder if this will be like the mentality of there's a lot of pressure going into these games in Kansas City or if the message will be like, why not us? Like we have nothing to lose. Yeah. Nobody expects us to go far. Why not just throw throw the kitchen sink at Texas and then see – if you can steal another one against Iowa state who you've played pretty well against in both games. Yeah. I, well, and it's going to be interesting too, because Jerome saying last year, I mean, he, he talked about it yesterday. They came in, they, they weren't in Kansas city for very long. And he, you know, after that game last year, he talked about, Hey, we got to get these guys ready for the NCAA tournament. We'll have them ready for that and everything. It's like, well, yeah, I remember thinking, okay, you can, but like you didn't have them ready for this tournament. And so I wonder how the preparation will be for that, because I think there's one thing that people think about is that Baylor very rarely did you see them go very far in the big 12 tournament. Uh, so, I mean, K state was one of the teams that dealt them an early loss in 2017 with a not so good team. I mean, team that made the tournament, but first four. So I think it'll be interesting to see if if Tang has that in him and if he can get things figured out there because they need a good showing in Kansas City. And we can jump into to it right now. It'll be Texas in the in the first round, or I guess second round technically, because they'll have two games the day before, but not playing on loser day. So first normal day of the tournament, Wednesday at six, they will face Texas. There was a chance that it could have been TCU or BYU. Which of those three would you have rather K-State faced in terms of, hey, I think they match up well, and I think K-State can get the job done? Obviously, they had beaten BYU once, lost at the horn to TCU, and played a disgusting game with Texas. Yeah, I I mean, obviously, I I think TCU would have been the easiest opponent uh, to play for the 48th time in the Big 12 tournament. (laughs) So much. I think think it would have been the seventh time since 2015 to play TCU uh, in the Big 12 tournament, but – I think they would have been the easiest uh, opponent to face um, between BYU and Texas. I don't know. Like I, I think BYU is is a harder team to play, and BYU in the playing in their bit first Big Twelve tournament could be playing for something. I also think BYU is a much better coach team than Texas. I do not think Rodney Terry is a very good coach. I think that is one of the advantages K State can have in this game. Uh, I think Texas has some of the most talent, at least in their top five, as any team in the Big 12. So I think that's the scary thing about playing Texas is is the talent factor, but I don't think they're well coached. I think they probably underachieved as much as any team in this league this season. Um, so so that's a factor. I don't know how motivated they'll be. Um, they did win three of their last four, and the, the three they won, they won convincingly. Uh, they had you know at least two games in there with 30-point outings. Um, you know, you mentioned Tyrese Hunter, um, uh, but Ace Miss also had a 30 point adding at Baylor. So um, that's another factor. So you look at those things and, and that's that's what you want to look at. Um, we K-State was very bad on offense. Uh, just looking at K-State against uh, top 150 Kim Palm teams this year. It was their first, fourth worst efficiency. It was their fourth worst shooting game. It was their fourth first game from two and their fourth worst game. Uh, on the offensive rebounding uh, boards in Austin. So some things that weren't very good. Texas's offense wasn't great either. K-State played decent defense, but Texas made enough plays to win that game. Um, and K-State's obviously going to have to improve by on that. All three of the big three had deficiencies of 1.0 or worse, although, like I said, Kluma did score 17. So um, that's going to have to be better. But like I said, Texas isn't very – Defensive minded, they're not great on defense. Plus, both Acemus and Hunter uh, are very, you know, six foot, six one guards. They're not the big, huge guards that have given Terry uh, Perry the most problems. So I think that matchup wise is better. Um, but again, you got to get two of the three going. I think that was kind of the middle of the worst of the Cam Carter funk. And hopefully, yesterday was a sign that he's coming out of that. Yeah, because yeah. we saw yesterday how good Cam Carter 
is when he doesn't turn the ball over. Yeah. And like, that's just a key thing. I mean, he was turning the, he still turned the ball over less this year at, at a rate lesser than what he did last season, but he's got the ball more. So it's more noticeable. And he's, he's a legit player when he's able to control the ball. We'll just see how things go. I mean, I, I said, uh, on uh, yesterday to somebody like the way K-State plays basketball is both offense and defense. It's like they don't know that there's a basketball on the court when they're playing. And sometimes that includes the guys that have the basketball in their hands. They don't they don't even know what they're dribbling there. They're, they just think it's air or something because <laughs> they, they seem careless or to not know what's going on there. But Cam Carter played well yesterday because like I he turned it over early in the game. And I tweeted Cam Carter turnover. I was going to tweet that every time he turned it over yesterday because I was just like, it's going to happen. And people are, you know, like, oh, you're too negative. Well, I'm I'm going to annoy you. And you're going to go, man, it seems like he's tweeted that a lot today. It's because I normally would have. Uh, but yesterday he was he was good. And I hope it's a, a sign that he's got something figured out or at least can rein it in because that, that gives K-State a chance to beat anybody, including a Texas team that, has underachieved at parts of this season and like they can go through their nasty offensive stretches. So if you have somebody like him stepped up and ready to go, you can, you can win this game. Yeah. I think what scares you probably the most about Texas is the firepower. Like Tyrese Hunter hasn't been great since transferring to Texas, but did score 30 against Oklahoma yesterday. Dylan Basu is one of the best players in the entire league and Max A. Smith gets buckets. So you you worry about if the game gets into like an offensive sh- uh, an offensive game, does K State have enough firepower to combat that? You know, I think that's what I worry about the most with this matchup because Texas isn't a super scary team. I was there in Austin; it was a very gross game. Like I, it, it was, it was almost like what the entire Iowa State game was yesterday. If they just played the first half. And the first half was the same as the second. So it wasn't a great game at Austin the first time. I think I would have rather played TCU, even though I keep saying that TCU is a team that I think might make a run in the NCAA tournament. I I just don't think that TCU has enough to beat K-State because TCU just has a bunch of really solid guys. But I think with the right matchup, TCU could go really far in the NCAA tournament. And then BYU is probably in the middle there. Uh, and honestly, probably closer to what TCU is because I, I thought the K State should have played better mm-hmm. when they went to Provo and potentially won, and then they handled them in Manhattan. And this BYU team, outside of the game that they played at KU, has been pretty bad in uh, or, uh, road environments. It's good, and it would be a road environment for them in Kansas City if they would have played K State, but. Uh, it's not a terrible matchup. And like I said in the instant reaction yesterday, you can squint and see a little bit of a path for K State. Yeah, yeah, you can see it. It's it's there. There's a possibility of it. I'm not as I'm not as uh, high as you are on TCU making a run. I but I like I would have rather have seen K State play them. I think BYU's last because I feel like as much as K State played good defense in those games to cause BYU to short, shoot poorly. I don't know that BYU would normally shoot as bad as they did in both of those. So it would kind of seem like, you know, third time around, they, they'd probably catch fire. Texas is probably in the middle there, and they're just concerning because the Sue and Acemas could go off at any point. And kind of to what Fan was saying, if those guys get going, they can hit tough shots, and K State just doesn't have the guys that can keep up with something like that. So you'd have to really hope that, you know, Texas's defense is lacking uh, when, you, when you face them, and we'll see kind of how. It ends up going down. I uh, looked. K State has met Texas twice before in the Big 12 tournament. The last time was in 2013. That was the first game of that tournament uh, where K State ended up going to the title game and lost to KU. They beat Texas 66 to 49. And then the only other time that the two teams played, uh, K State lost in the opening round of the 2009 tournament to Texas 61 to 58. So. We were thinking about this yesterday as the opponents were coming up because, golly, TCU has been seen a ton. Uh, there was a stretch there where they saw Baylor a good number of times. Iowa State has been somewhat common up there, but I don't know that anybody compares to TCU no. uh, ever no. in the Big 12, which is nuts because TCU's only been in this league since 2013. 
Well, the we were talking about teams that we hadn't seen K State play a lot, and like outside of 2017, I can't remember K State playing West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a good call. Oklahoma. Uh, I don't yeah. think they've ever haven't played Oklahoma in the Big 12 tournament very often. No, in, Te- in some memory. Recently, Texas Tech has not been a team that they've seen. Yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah. I mean, Oklahoma State, they early on there, like I feel like Frank probably played Oklahoma yeah. State a good number of times. That was probably like that era's TCU where it was like, up <laughs> oh, Oklahoma State again. Here we go. Uh, cause I just feel like I remember seeing that bright orange a bunch. So we'll see. Uh, it's, it's always a blast up there in Kansas city and obviously K state and Texas. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this at the end and do some predictions. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the big 12 tournament at large, there's a look at the bracket and how things shape up. So you have the two games that are going to go ahead and take place on Tuesday, loser day, as I've been referring to it and the cats, they are not losers. I texted my dad after the game, and uh, I said, man, 10th place has never felt so good. Uh, <laughs> not only was it the win over Iowa State, but the fact that we don't have to show up with those bums on Tuesday. Uh, so UCF and O-State get it started. West Virginia and Cincinnati then will go after that. Those are in the afternoon. It's like 1130 and 2 o'clock. So if you want an excuse to not go to work, there it is. Say, hey, I'm going to the Big 12 tournament. Then after that, uh, BYU and the winner of the 12-13 game get things started on Wednesday at 1130. OU and TCU after that. Then K-State Texas starts the evening session at 6, and then KU will face the 11 or 14 uh, at 830, which if this works out the way that the Big 12 absolutely wants it to, K-State, KU, and Iowa State will all be playing Thursday night in the same session That will be an absolute madhouse and like ticket bonanza there. So the cops will have to be called. Yes. Yeah. Because, because Bill Self and Jerome Tang will be near each other and maybe have to shake hands. That's why the cops will have to be called. So, uh, what do we think of how the big, the big 12 tournament has drawn here? And what uh, do we think the chances are of somebody from Wednesday? making a run in this thing like who is the best candidate on wednesday that starts uh that can make it to the title game and maybe win the big 12 tournament wow no love for the teams on tuesday i see no (laughs) you know uh let's see 2019 i remember we uh a number of us filled out a little like questionnaire for kso and uh something was about like surprise team and i was all about oklahoma state if they just won on wednesday and they didn't but my entire thing was about how much i love that oklahoma state team but i was a big thomas dezagua and lindy waters guy so can you blame me uh but of those teams who are you guys taking to, to maybe make a sneaky run and is it the cats i i would I, I mean i like the cats but my my first pick would be byu just because I think they're going to get favorable matchups um, in both their first and second game. And then you play Houston and you hit a bunch of threes because that's probably what you have to do to beat Houston anyway. Uh, And then you make the championship game. So I I would say them. And then I would say the other one would be probably us or Texas. Like I think the winner of that that game could be the one that makes a run um, just because I think K-State has – maybe the most to play for of any team in this tournament. And I think Texas, like we've talked about, has the best one-two punch of any ter- team in this tournament. So I would put those three as, as the highest candidates to make that run. Yeah, that would sound really lame because mm. I'm about to say the exact same thing. Like <laughs> B- BYU is probably the prime candidate because they, with how they shoot, they're never out of a game. But also like you, we've seen before that they can shoot their way out of a game too. But when they're making threes and all it takes is one big run for a week where you don't just, where you make 50, 52% of your threes and you're probably going to win this thing. And then uh, just K-State and Texas, because K-State has the most to play for Texas probably has the best one, two punch and Iowa state's kind of been slipping on offense. And then you have Baylor who doesn't or Baylor or KU or Cincinnati or West Virginia. I'll be nice to the Tuesday people. <laughs> and, and 
those two, and all four of those teams kind of have their flaws. KU is really hurt right now. Baylor right. isn't great defensively. Cincinnati is just okay, and West Virginia is terrible. So, I mean, that, that, those those are the four on that side. Well, and if you look at it, I mean the the matchups. Like, I do think that there would be a realistic path for any of the teams that went on Tuesday, like that they are playing on Thursday because we know how banged up KU is. Uh, KU will have the benefit of that. Will probably be a pretty well. It'll be interesting. Like, it'll probably be a pretty home gamey crowd when they play. Uh, but they'll also have a lot of people there that are any other school in the league or two teams that really hate them in K-State and Iowa State that will root for whoever they're playing. Um, but like Cincinnati still has something to play for, so maybe they could do something. And then BYU, if they're just not hitting shots, like UCF has shown that they've got the peak to beat about anybody in the Big 12 this season. Um, out of the teams that finished in the bottom, they gave Houston probably their best run for their money at any point this year. But I think you you guys are right. The answer is probably BYU for a team that plays Tuesday or Wednesday to make a run. Um, the only team that I'm confident in saying doesn't do anything special is Oklahoma. Number one, <laughs> because whoever plays Houston, like that's just going to be a buzzsaw. But number two, I don't think Oklahoma has done anything impressive since probably winning by 20 in Manhattan. Uh, that's mm -hmm. probably the most notable thing that they've done this season. Uh, because they're non-conference, they got a decent amount of buzz for, but you look at that and they kind of got the the K-State trap there where the teams they ended up playing, those wins didn't amount to much. Like Arkansas, nobody cares uh, that, that you won that game. Same for their win over USC at the buzzer. So it'll be fascinating to watch and kind of see how uh, things play out. In terms of who you guys think is going to be the realistic winner here, because I mean, I don't know exactly off the top of my head how many times the one seed has won the Big 12 tournament, but it seems like it doesn't happen that often. Uh, do we think Houston is motivated enough to kind of keep proving that this thing is real and they want every ounce of Big 12 accolades they can get, or is somebody else going to come out of this thing as the winner? I don't even think it's like a motivation thing with Houston. I, I just think that they're that much better than everybody else. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, I, and I think – you know, I think they're still kind of playing for that overall number one seed. I think it's still in in a possibility for them. Maybe maybe they already are close to being that. So, I think getting the overall number one seed is is a factor in the in the NCAA Blade tournament. And plus, I just I agree with Drew. They're they're a factor better than everybody. Um, when I've done my, I like to look at efficiency differential just in Big Twelve play. And theirs is like 0.16 or 0.17. And the next closest team was Iowa State or Baylor at like 0 0.07 or 0 0.08. Like they were double efficiency differential anybody else in the league. And then everybody else is pretty much jumbled up in the middle. So um, I think that's it's not an end-all be-all, but I think that's a good factor in, in how much you've dominated the league. Um, I think Houston had a couple miscues early uh, and then the loss at Kansas. Uh, but otherwise they've – They've been the dominant team. I, I will say Houston and Iowa State messed up what would have been a pretty perfectly symmetrical standings of 14 and 4, uh, 11 and 7, all the way down the line. You have two teams all at the same record throughout the, the standings, which would have been kind of for a weird person like me who yeah. likes to see patterns and, and numbers. So those two messed that up, but that's all right. Uh, real quick, something I noticed that's just kind of odd because I was thinking back to Jalen Bridges and the game he had against Iowa State last year in a losing effort. I was stunned to, to look at his Big 12 tournament history. Uh, he's played in three Big 12 tournaments uh, prior to this one, and twice he has faced the same team that he ended the regular season against. Uh, his first year at West Virginia, they played Oklahoma State back-to-back, -back, and then last year they played Iowa State back-to-back. -back. Does it matter? No, uh, just something kind of odd that came up uh, in, in what I was looking at. Uh, so we, we kind of know what's going on with the bracket and everything else in the Big 12 tournament. Which players are going to be the guys that kind of stand out there in Kansas City and could probably carry a team a little bit further uh, than what maybe the collection of talent is? Because the Big 12 tournament, all these conference tournaments, is a different beast than – the NCAA tournament and what you do in the regular season because you're playing so many games in a row on consecutive days 
It's just whoever's on that heater can get something going. Uh, and Jalen Bridges, obviously, last year he tried for Baylor, but nobody else wanted to help him out. <laughs> so, I mean, does K-State have a guy like that? Like if Cam Carter or Arthur Kaluma gets things rolling? Uh, or are we, we looking around the rest of the league and seeing who can do that? You know, I, I was just looking, I was thinking about when we talked about, number one, this would be my other team that uh, underachieved more than anybody. Raekwon Battle in West Virginia, like that guy's going to sh- take 30 shots. And if he happens to make That's a true. bunch of them, plus he's got Krissa and Edwards as complimentary players, like they have as good a three or four on paper talent players as anybody in the league. They just have never put it together and, Three, three or four of those guys only played two thirds of the season, but um, they got a they guy from a part of Kansas that just doesn't know how to coach. I know <laughs> Osborne County had a little run early in the Big Twelve, but <laughs> since then it's been pretty ugly for the Mountaineers. But just talent wise, you look at those guys, um, and then you know I, I hate to say it, Asmus and Desu would be <laughs> two that could either one of those kids guys could go off and 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 put a team on their back. Um, you know, going into the tournament, you know, you would maybe say Hunter Dickinson, but I don't, he, he may not even play in this tournament. So that's one. Uh, Houston really doesn't have a guy like that. They're kind of a collective unit. Iowa State's kind of the same way. And BYU's kind of the same way. So you have several teams that they really don't have that one standout guy uh, besides a few of them. So those would be the ones that kind of stood out to me. Yeah, the one for me that really – kind of pops out that uh fan didn't mention to be like Jacoby Walter or yeah. Jacoby Walter or Ray J. Dennis could really go off and single-handedly win Baylor some games. It, like you said, the the thing that scares me the most about Texas is that Max Asmus and Dylan DeSu are the two guys that really could carry Texas to a big run. But I mean Tyler Perry could do the same thing for K State. Yeah. And if he would probably be the one that I think would be the one to get K State the furthest just because of his ability to hit the three at a more consistent clip than the other than Carter and Kaluma. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably fair. I think, I think Cam could have some of that in him because like we, we saw, I really think Cam's game is just dependent on if he's not turning the ball over and mm-hmm. I would like for him to attack more. I felt like yesterday at times K state had an opportunity. He and Kal- Carter and Kaluma both where they got a pretty good matchup for themselves and they would get it about halfway there, but then they were already looking to do something different. Like I think you got to recognize better when you have an ability to try and go and get to the basket. And Cam Carter's been at his best this year when he's tried to do that uh, because he can finish because you you don't want him doing a whole lot else. So uh, I think you need an aggressive cam in terms of when he has the ball in his hands uh, and is actually moving with it as opposed to, I mean, he'll throw some bad passes and, he himself will not be ready for some passes, so we'll see. All right, at the end of all this, if you had to pick out a bracket, who is winning the Big 12 and who are they playing in the championship game? Uh, I'll go Houston over Baylor. Interesting. I, okay. I just think that Houston has the best team and Baylor probably has the best guards. I'm going to go Baylor over BYU. It's just mm, for a little while. Get a little frisky with his pick. Okay. Well, I am going to go Iowa State over Houston. So, uh, I mean, come on. This is these guys are going to show up to Kansas City and not play in their their actual Super Bowl. They're gonna they're gonna be out there ready to show up. So, I I think Iowa State. This feels like the year, and they get like a a win that helps them fly high in the NCAA tournament. And then they lose in the second round because their offense isn't anything special. And they play like some electric, you know, mid-major team that can score from anywhere. Uh, so I, I think that Iowa State, they they might be the victim of awesome conference tournament, bad showing in the NCAA tournament. So we'll kind of see uh, how that ends up playing out. Do anybody here think K-State plays on Friday? Like dead set they play on Friday? Because you guys both took Baylor – to make it to the to the title game, I, I think there's a possibility they could play on Friday. I think you know if if, if everything goes the way it needs to go, um, I think that could happen. I, I do think K State wins Wednesday. I think they get the first win, uh, beating Iowa State twice in 
four days or five days or whatever um, probably becomes a challenge, especially them playing in Kansas City and probably wanting to show better than they showed in Manhattan. So that's a factor that would make that game tougher. But I, I, I think there's definitely a possibility in case they could make a run in this tournament. I think there's a chance, but I think that there's so much on the line with the Texas game too that I, I think that game could be a knockdown drag out and you're playing Iowa State who didn't have to play the day before and just the fact of them being more fresh could mm-hmm. put them over the top. And I think it does make it tough that you did just play them and so they'll have that. So I I, I get that. I, I think there's a chance, but I think it's unlikely. And so it's really just going to come down to is if they can beat Texas, is that enough to make the final case put us in because we have these quad one wins and everything else, which let's dive into that now because that's probably the main thing people are interested in. Time for our favorite game, NCAA, NIT, or nothing, and we'll go a little bit more in-depth on this one today. Uh, I feel pretty good in saying that we don't have to worry about the nothing thing now for a couple of reasons. They've played better. And also, in addition to that, I know that some people will have the conversation, well, should you take an NIT bid or reject it? Like, what's the point of it? Uh, I think given the nature uh, and personality of this coaching staff, the fact that Jerome Tang at Baylor was in the NIT and they feel like they benefited from it in terms of kind of building things, and also the fact that a guy like Tyler Perry, I think if he wants to play more college basketball, They're going to do it for Tyler Perry and give him that chance. Same for a guy like Will McNair. Um, I think that's where they would sit. So I think the floor for this team is the NIT because I have a tough time seeing them get left out, even though they won't get like an AQ spot from the Big 12. That'll probably go to UCF and Cincinnati. So really this question today is just NCAA or NIT. And uh, I'll let Drew make his case here one way or the other. I'll say NIT for now. I just, I don't think that winning one in Kansas City is going to end up being enough because the, the bubble is starting to get a little bit more crowded because no, nobody really wants to win on the bubble. But you worry until they that, all win on the same day. I was going to say until they all win on the same day. And you worry about now when you're trying to get back onto the bubble, does Memphis win the American? Does somebody not named Dayton win the A-10? You you worry about the bid stealers more than anything else. It's well, like- I, let me, real quick, Dayton should not be an NCAA tournament team if they don't win the A-10. I have watched that team enough on Friday nights to know that they are the biggest frauds out there. So, no, Dayton should not be in. I, I'm sick of these people trying to cater and act like they know and love basketball. Like, we got to get more mid-majors in there. We got we to gotta love them up. No, Mountain West should not have six teams. Dayton should not be in. Indiana State should not be in. I know that you all just discovered Robbie Avila this year. Real ones like me were watching him in Arch Madness last year and betting on his over in points. So, no. No to these mid-majors. We don't need to give them our pity. (laughs) Screw them. But, I mean, then you also worry about a team like Wake Forest getting hot, too. So, I mean, there's enough that could go against you if you only win one game in Kansas city and we all kind of said that we only think K-State's going to win one game in Kansas city to make it in an in in NIT bid is probably the most likely at this point. Yeah. I, I going one to one in Kansas city was going to get you to five quad one wins, which is as many as any of the uh, teams around you on the bubble. K-State's biggest problem is there are four and six in quad two. And that's one of the worst records of the teams around them on the bubble. And that's what's really did them in this season um, and, and, and is the thing that could keep them out of the dance. So um, I, I would say NIT is most likely. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't mind the NIT coming up with this set rule of how they're going to put a team in uh, the, the power, power five teams in. Cause even if you go look back at the, to the past, usually those, Power six leagues have had two teams in anyway. So I don't think that's a hard, necessarily a bad thing. I do think then making them the automatic home games in the top two seeds yeah. is a problem because UCF is not even close to the bubble. No. And Cincinnati really isn't even close to the bubble right now. 
we're K State is much closer to the bubble than either school, but those two teams are jumping us uh, based on that net rating criteria. Which again, I don't hate it that you give those teams automatic, but I think you should still do a, a, a selection process to see the top four, second four, et cetera, and treat it like a mini NCAA tournament, not because uh, that's kind of what they're trying to say they're doing um, with with putting the power yeah. six teams in there, but. That's a that's but it's you're in the NIT, so I'm not I'm not gonna <laughs> lobby too much because you know you didn't earn your trip to the dance. Yeah. I do hold the NIT in a little better regard than most people probably. I think it's still a worthwhile endeavor and, and can help your team, even on a team like K-State's, which may not have a lot of these guys coming back. I still think you build momentum in your program however you can. Um, and like you've mentioned, the Baylor thing, they they did take two teams to the finals and, and win one that went on to go to sweet 16 and lead eight the next year. One of those teams was like a team that had like five seniors that were, were the bulk of the players on the NIT team. So they had pretty much a brand new team the next year. So, um, but I think that's going to be Tang's message. If K-State does make the NIT, look at what we did at Baylor. Yeah. This is what we're going to try to do. And we're going to try to build it for our program. So that's well, what and, and just to paint the picture, a uh, little bit different because we know the Big 12 was weaker around this time, but their first NIT where they were they were runner up the first time they went, that was coming off of the first NCAA tournament appearance mm-hmm. they had at Baylor, uh, and they finished fourth in the Big 12 that season or the the in the year that they finished uh, in the NCAA tournament. The next year they were ninth at five and 11, 24 and 15 overall. They went to the NIT. They were runner up. The next year they went to the Elite Eight. And the only, the second time they went to the NIT and won it at Baylor, they were coming off of an Elite Eight season where they finished fourth in the Big 12. So, like, they – it's not like at Baylor they were just like, yeah, hey, this team, uh, we're, too, we're too good for that. They had reached what they wanted to. It's not like – you know, Wichita State made a big deal of it. I think they won the 2011 mm-hmm. NIT. That was those guys building up and setting the foundation for their program to – be a team that two years later was in the final four and like we're in the NCAA tournament Baylor. They just used it as like, uh, and I, how I think teams should, like if you've got older guys that want to play in it, let them play in it, do it for them. And you do have younger guys that you want to develop more basketball at the collegiate level and playing for something where every game really matters is not a bad thing for day day Ames or RJ Jones or for those of you that are salivating and want more Michaela Rich, he could play more in something like that because, you know, whatever. So I think that's I think that's a good thing uh, for them and a good opportunity. So I would be I would be all for it uh, if if they were able to get in. I do think that it is probably the NIT for K State at this stage because I, I mean, do all three of us think they're in if they do win two games in Kansas City? If they beat Texas and Iowa State, they're in the NCAA tournament. I do think they would be in. Yeah. I'm not. I, I'm not going to say for sure, but I'd say probably. If they only beat Texas, are you watching Selection Sunday, telling yourself they're not going to be in, but you still have the nerves and you're thinking maybe their name pops up, and then you'll be a little disappointed when they've rattled off 68 teams in case State's not there. Yeah, I, I will watch, and I watch closer if Lenardi starts tipping his hand because he sometimes does that because I know he. I mean, um, I, I think he's good at what he does, but I do think he gets info to kind of build. Momentum. Well, he absolutely yeah. does, because think about uh, after one of the games last week, it was before the Cincinnati game where Lenardi didn't have K-State like anywhere in the in the picture. And then all of a sudden he jumps him up to like the top of the next four out or whatever. Yeah. And you're going, OK. He didn't have them anywhere near this thing, and now they're at the top. Like somebody told him, "Hey, K State's closer than you think, Bucko." He he tipped his hand this morning in his uh, projection by saying that he moved uh, Villanova from first team out to last team in, and New Mexico from last team in to first team out. Oh, because he did some overnight like more research or whatever. <laughs> it's like, bro, you're just tipped off. Say that you're tipped off, and we can move on. Uh, speaking of bubbles and Villanova plays a role in this Villanova, if they win two games, probably in the big East tournament, they could slide back up to a quad one win. Uh, and just for context for people uh, that are probably thinking, well, Cincinnati similar record, like they beat K state, like how are they not closer to the bubble? They're six, uh, they're six and 11 in quad one and two and three and 10 against quad one. 
Uh, they also have two quad three losses, including a home game to Oklahoma State. So it, they they have just some not good uh, resume finds for them. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what it looks like for some of these and how things kind of clear up for K-State and if oh, they get I, any help. I was about to bring this up. Are we rooting for Villanova in the Big East tournament or do we want them to lose now? Because it, it's a bubble spot or it's a quad one win. Well, I would say you for sure want them to win the first game. Uh, they played DePaul, so <laughs> I don't, you know, that's probably fine. I don't think them beating DePaul is like, okay, they're a lock. Lenardi gets that call from whoever his source is like, did you see that one over DePaul? They are in. So he's, he moves them up to like a 10 seed, not even in Dayton anymore, something like that. So I think that you want them to win the first game. I'll look real quick to see uh, – who they will end up playing uh, in their like second game, because that would maybe make you think a little bit more about it. Uh, but I don't know. I, I think it's, I think you want, I think you want Villanova to succeed. Cause if they're in now, I don't know that that's the team that you're going to see maybe get pushed to the side. Cause even though Jay Wright's not there anymore, I think Villanova barring a loss to DePaul, they probably get some of that new blood cachet that they'll get a bump for. And that's the thing too, like K state is going to get, not just because of their good wins. I think that they would get a slight Jerome Tang bump, like having Jerome Tang as their head coach benefits them. Other teams that are near the bubble, uh, I think aren't going like they'll get not necessarily a negative, but they're not getting impacted by who their head coach is, where they look and go, oh, this guy kind of boring. I don't, I don't really care to, you know, do him any saw, but Jerome Tang is a selling point and was good for March Madness last year. Um, and as much as people would probably try to say, well, that's not how they do it. And they'd argue that I think that absolutely plays a part of it. So I think that there yeah. would be a possibility to get a bump from that. Yeah. I think, I think those factors all, I mean, cause you have 12 humans looking at these teams and making decisions. And when they compare, they're comparing eight teams at a time. Like yeah, they always, they always do it at eight teams at a time. They're gonna they're gonna pull. They have a process where it's always an eight team comparison when they're looking. So any of those little factors that you can you can have to make your team look prettier than another ugly looking middle of the pack power five team, those are good points to have. So I, I do think that factors in because you have humans making these decisions and they're they're gonna have influences other than quad one wins and road wins and net rankings in their minds as they're looking at these teams yeah uh, real quick uh if if villanova wins they would play marquette in the second round and marquette's it, been banged up so it, it's gonna be fun to scoreboard watch this upcoming week because i mean there's more big east teams like the, the teams that you're for sure rooting against are providence and st john's yep yeah the interesting thing yeah so st john's is one of those uh Providence is is slipping, so yeah, you would like to see them lose. In addition to that, uh, Drake won today in the Missouri Valley Championship game, so they are in. It's going to be interesting to see what some of these guys do with Indiana State. Where is their bubble status? Are they moved out? Look, I I think uh, Indiana State, you know, good, good for them. Whatever, fun story. Uh, I, I love seeing teams in the Missouri Valley have success after Wichita State thought they were better off moving on elsewhere. There's just like, if we're being realistic about this, they're five and four in quad one and two, and they're one and three against quad one. Their only quad one game is they won at Bradley. Uh, that's their only quad one win. Their other two chances in conference play were against Drake. They lost. And then they all, actually they're one and four in quad one because they haven't updated today. And then, they got housed by Alabama, and they got beat at Michigan State during a time in which Michigan State was playing really bad. So I don't think they are deserving of it, so I wouldn't worry about that. They also have a disgusting uh, quad four loss that they suffered against Illinois State at home right after they were put in the top 25 for the first time in program history. So I, I great story, whatever. Indiana State should not be a team that gets in the NCAA tournament. Uh, and like I've said already, the Mountain West, the PR that's been done for them, hats off to that. Like, I, I don't buy into the Mountain West. There's no way six Mountain West teams should be in there, especially considering the fact that I think San Diego State's the only one that's ever been successful. Uh, Colorado State got shoehorned in and they got beat by a team that everybody in a Michigan team that everybody thought would lose a couple years ago. So 
get the Mountain West out of here. I don't think they end up getting <laughs> six in like some are saying right now. Yeah, give me more Mountain West and less Big Ten and Big East if that's the option. Like, I, well, I there no part of me wants like St. John's on the tournament. So. Well, I brought I brought this up uh, yesterday with some people. There's a lot of talk about the Big Twelve gaming the net. Uh, has anybody tr- figured out how Villanova has like lost? half the games on their schedule, but it's still (laughs) 32 in the net. That is gaming the net if I've ever seen it. Because I've seen Villanova play in person. I've seen them play on TV. And I've seen the fact that they're like 18 and 16. What are we doing here? Why why are we giving Villanova so much love? So I think they've gamed the net. Study their system and uh, what they've done. Yeah, at some point you are what your record says. And Villanova is not very good 17 and 14 but they could be 18 and 15 and make the NCAA tournament Villanova also had I mean they have the three quad three losses to every school that exists inside Philadelphia so that kick him out uh but let him be a good win for K-State that's that's the, <laughs> the the fine line that we skate so everybody's in agreement NIT seems likely for K-State yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we'll see how it goes. But K State could turn around. We all seem to think that if they do win two, they would get themselves in because, I mean, it'd be tough to deny a team with what K State's resume would be if they got two wins in Kansas City because it's two more quad one wins. And if you then end up looking at like how they stand up overall, they'd be 20 and 14 mm-hmm. uh, and, and have wins against 10 big 12 teams. So we'll see how it kind of plays out there. Uh, uh well, you go ahead. I'm just gonna say that the combo of having 20 quad one or 20 total wins and 10 or 11 quad one, quad two combined wins looking through just past bubbles, that's a pretty surefire way to get yourself in the tournament. So that's a good combo to have. Yeah. Uh all right. Go back real quick. K State, Texas on Wednesday night in T Mobile Center. Uh, give me your guys' predictions for the game as K-State playing on Thursday in the rematch against Iowa State and clinging to their NCAA tournament hopes. I I, I would say, yeah, I think K-State, I think another tight game, probably something like 68-65. Um, I think K-State plays better offense than they did in Ames or in Austin, and, and they get two of the big three. I think Perry finally breaks out of his little two-game funk. And then I think Carter might have another good game uh, back to back as well. So I think you get those two going and, you know, Kaluma just even a, a third solid game. And, you know, if, if you get Gasson playing well um, and, and you make, you know, make it tough on Hunter and, or uh, Ace Hunter and the Sioux inside and you give yourself a chance. So I, I do think K-State wins that game. It's a tight one. Um, I think Coach Tang, out coaches coach Terry as well. I think that's a big factor too to me. Uh I'll say case it wins 72 to 71. I, I think like fan that this is gonna be a, a nail biter kind of coin flip kind of game. And I think that that's what everybody kind of expects going in with with these teams and they're pretty similar and how they just aren't very consistent on the year. But I think case they gets it done. I think the crowd will play a big factor because it should be a pretty vocal k-state crowd uh just based on what we saw in the women's game yesterday it it could be a pretty big k-state crowd and and i think that carter kaluma and perry do just enough to win and you see where the chips fall against iowa state yeah i i think they beat texas as well i think they'll be motivated they'll have the crowd uh texas i mean like historically speaking, I you know, I know that the last couple of years they've had some good runs in Kansas City. I just don't know like that it'll make a ton of sense. And maybe you look around and you say, is it worth like the Sioux's had struggles with injuries lately? Like how many of these teams are in rest mode in the Big 12? Because Texas is safe and I don't think anything they do in Kansas City is going to change much of the opinion on them. So I, I think K-State having more to play for is a beneficial thing. I think last year, K-State kind of showed up, and there that was a team that there wasn't much to play for for them there. Like, maybe if they had gone on and won the thing, they'd jump up to a two seed, but they weren't going to go any higher than that. 
And I think motivation was low, and they obviously got right when they needed to for the NCAA tournament. Um, so I, I think that's probably where things sit, and then we'll just kind of see how the the vibes are uh, with the game against uh, Iowa State that would come about then on Thursday. I, I'm going through real quick right now, and I am adding up to see how the uh, the teams have squared off in Big 12 tournaments for K State. It's kind of fascinating to to go and find this and see. Uh, how often they've played somebody. So they've played KU 10 times in Big 12 tournament history. That is the most of anybody that they've faced, which may be a little surprising for people um, to think about that, but they have actually met KU quite a bit there, which is good for probably whoever is hosting uh, the Big 12 tournament. And <laughs> the other good thing for the people involved in that, if you're thinking about, wow, that's a lot, um, Four of the last five times the teams have met in that situation, it's been either the semifinals or the final. So it hasn't been like uh, weird. Um, they met in the quarterfinals uh, a handful of times, and then uh, they they also had uh, a semifinals appearance earlier on there. After KU, though, it is easily TCU who they have played the most, the second most times at the Big 12 tournament, a team that has only been playing in the Big 12 since 2013. <laughs> Uh, that is more than Baylor, who has been in the league since it started. They've played five times. They have played Colorado, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, and Texas A&M three times. Texas Tech three times as well. This will be the third meeting with Texas. West Virginia, they have only played twice. And this might be shocking to some, but in the history of the Big 12, K-State only played Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma one time. The Oklahoma, probably the most surprising because they have a decade plus extra on Missouri and Nebraska in that stretch. So kind of a, an interesting note to, to look at. And TCU, I mean, they're, they're more than a lot of teams that were in the original Big 12 that K-State could have faced uh, as well. So, uh, And like that's overall, uh, they're, they're close with those. K-State's played Nebraska seven times in conference tournaments. Uh, only once as a Big 12 school, though. Missouri, they played seven times. Um, Iowa State, five times. So it's it's up there with uh, how it works out. K-State and KU have met 23 times in conference tournament games, easily the most uh, out of anybody that K-State has played. So you get that third K-State-KU game a lot, which makes sense because I think if you go back and look at some of the, the history – it seems like K State and KU played that third time like every year in like the eighties and nineties. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. any any Big Twelve memories from the tournament that you have that you enjoy, fan? Because I I think it's one of the the best things going. I love conference tournament week, and more than anything, I love being at a conference tournament, especially the one for you know the one my school plays in and the one that I grew up watching that league. Like it's fun. It was fine the one year I had to go to the American Athletic Conference tournament, but it was lame and it's nothing like what Kansas City and the Big 12 do. So uh, what is your what are some favorite Big 12 tournament memories you have? Uh, the, the first one I ever went to was back when it still was in Kemper. And it was Woolley's good year when K-State went 17 and 12. It was also <laughs> another year where they lost to KU in the second round, but – they beat Mark Turgeon and Texas A&M in the first round, 68-62. And uh, at the time, they were on the NIT bubble. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, and some of us thought, well, maybe this was what gets us into the NIT and gets Jim Woolridge finally a, 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 a chance to play uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the postseason. Uh, Sadly, it was not enough. That 17 and 12 team did not make it to the NIT, uh, unfortunately, at that point in time. And there was, I, I do think that team would have played in like the CBI if it existed yet, but it was not a thing. And then another one, this goes way back. Um, this was back the last time K State actually beat KU in the Big Eight tournament it was in 1991 or two, I believe. Um, it was in Kemper. I was not at the 93. game. I think. 23. Yeah, I was in Hayes. It was my senior year of high school. I was in Hayes because uh, we did not make the 1A state tournament that year. No. Downs Dragons were not very good, but we went to it. Our coach took a bunch of us players to the 
to the tournament. And then uh, in between games, we're in the Hayes Mall, and I think we were in uh, Foot Locker or something. That. And they had a TV on, and we watched the end of K State beating Kansas in the Big Eight <laughs> tournament at the time, which was a really fun game to watch. Uh, and then the run a couple years ago um, when they made the finals um, with the with the Bruce's team was a fun yeah. one. Um, that, that was probably the most fun because I was at those games and watched them win uh, several of those. Um, and then the uh, the uh, Mac Mac attack game against Kansas where he <laughs> scored thirty or whatever was was one I remember fondly. Uh, but in case they did not yeah. win the game. Sprint Center Mac. Yeah, that was the beginning <laughs> of Sprint Center Mac. That was a, a good old time there. Uh, Drew, what are what are some of your favorite Big Twelve tournament memories? I mean, how so fan? Do you know how many you've been to? What what will this be for you? I've been to probably seven or eight. You know, just first, especially mostly first round games. Yeah, probably the last decade I went pretty often, um, but. Uh, Last couple since I've been with working with you guys at KSO have been the only times I've been able to go to to any game K State was playing. Of course, last year that was a short trip. But <laughs> yes, that, also, no. The other memory is when in in 2020 when K State won the Big 12 tournament. Mm, yeah, by yeah the I'm to and winning the final one of the final games in college basketball that year. Yep. Hang the banner, national champs, <laughs> won the last game. <laughs> Uh, this is only my third Big 12 tournament, so some of my memories are like watching K State on TV, and we've talked about it a couple times. The, the 2017 Big 12 tournament is probably the one that stands out the most to me because it was like K State really needed to beat Baylor and then might have needed to beat West Virginia, and then they beat Baylor, lost to West Virginia close, and then you go to the first four and beat the crap out of Wake, and then no. lost and then lost a future Big 12 member, Cincinnati. Yeah, who would have thought Bruce <laughs> would have a team that scored 90 points in an NCAA tournament game? Uh, thank you, Danny Manning. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be Big 12 tournament number five for me. Uh, I was pretty hot 2021 when I had to go to the American and I didn't get to go to the Big 12. Uh, but 2017 was my first, and that was I was a freshman at K-State, and a, a buddy of mine that I had met on my floor my freshman year uh, earlier that year, we had just decided, like, hey, we're going to get tickets. We went to the K-State Iowa State football game in Ames together. Uh, so, like, he was as into K-State as I was. So, we were talking and we we're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's get tickets to the K-State Baylor game that night. So, we bought the tickets for the second session and uh, we, <laughs> we, we, we need to get there, though, because we bought them on StubHub. And StubHub, for like some of these events, you have to pick them up in person. Mm -hmm. It's not like digital. And so we had this thing that told us by, I don't know if it was like five o'clock or something, we had to be in one of the hotels in Kansas City and go into one of the convention rooms and pick up the, the physical tickets. Well, the only issue was I had a class that was going to run a little long uh, into that time. It was like a two-hour class, and I'm sitting there in Kedzie Hall, and I'm sweating, thinking, okay, maybe she's going to let us go early. Maybe she's going to. Because this is before, like I was, you know, college vet skipping classes left and right, didn't care, whatever. <laughs> this was like still like Mason being the, a a good boy and staying in class and not trying to disrespect teachers, which I never tried to do. But like I, I felt I was going to feel really bad, and I had to do it. And it just got to the point like he's driving his car in circles by Kedzie so he doesn't get a ticket for parking parking it, and he's like, "We got to go, we got to go." And so I just stood up. And, uh, I, I said to her, I was like, I hate to do this. I feel really bad about it, but I got to go to Kansas city. Cause I got tickets to the big 12 tournament. We got to go get them. And I just walked out. I didn't even wait for her to finish talking. Uh, and we went and we watched West Virginia and Texas in that first game. And then K state and Baylor. And I just remember, uh, you know, the old like commerce bank sign that's downtown Kansas city. We parked in that area, just like free parking through our car there. And then we had a like jog slash run our way to whatever hotel it was in Kansas City and get ourselves back. And we eventually did and uh, went in and enjoyed the game and had a good time. So that was that was definitely a good one. Uh, 2019 was fun until like the last three minutes of the Iowa State game mm -hmm. because it felt like they were making a little push. And that team, I mean, there were a lot of good vibes until there weren't uh, 
at the very end of that season. So that was a, that was a good time, but really I just enjoy being able to go there and hang out and watching a ton of basketball. Uh, it's, it's very reminiscent for me of like growing up in Hutch. You go to the NJCAA tournament mm -hmm. every year and you can just sit there and watch tons of games, but this is even better because these guys kind of know how to play and it's not just, Hey, we're either going to shoot a three and dunk it in the first five seconds of the shot clock. So it's a lot of fun uh, and a good time for everybody involved at the Big 12 tournament. So I'm looking forward to it. And we'll have more throughout the week from Kansas City. All of us will be there. So we'll have stuff before the game, during, and after. And uh, hopefully we're talking to you multiple days in Kansas City with K-State basketball going on and not just a bunch of guys sitting around watching basketball on Thursday because the Cats are already headed back to home, gearing up for the NIT, uh, <laughs> see if the Cats can you know, make it past the second round for the first time in my life in the NIT. So is that the furthest they've gone in the NIT? What, what, what's the NIT no. history before that? No, the, the best, the best year in the NIT was the ski Jones. Okay. 16. I didn't know how far that team they, went. They made it to Madison square garden to the final four. And, and then they guy. lost, they lost both games. Cause they, I think they still play the consolation game in the NIT, which is maybe the dumbest thing <laughs> in the world, but they, they do still. Cause I, we lost to, I can't remember who we – I have to go look it up. I, I know we lost the last one to Siena. I can't remember who we lost the finals to or the semifinals to. I I believe they have done away with uh, the, the the loser game in the NIT now. So I think well, – It's not even at the Garden anymore, so you had to get no. out of the competition. Hinkle Fieldhouse this year. Yeah, it's Indianapolis. So, so I'm trying uh, – well, I'm not seeing uh, uh, the NIT history here that I'm, that I'm looking for uh, – rather quickly because i just you know i'd be a little fascinated to see uh they played uh that's did one year in the 70s they played kentucky in the nit well that was you know that's old people say well that was like the ncaa tournament back then it was better well, so no not the 70 they lost to vanderbilt in the the final four of the nit and then they lost to Siena in the consolation game of the nit in uh, two power two powerhouses that case they lost to yeah, but then the the fun thing about that one was they beat three Bulldogs to get there, Mississippi <laughs> State, Gonzaga, and Fresno State was was the run to All make right. the final four. Well, uh, hopefully K State gets a little variety in who they beat. Uh, oh, over the next another couple another tidbit during the Asbury era, they also played TCU in the IT, led by <laughs> Billy Tubbs. Oh, okay, so that was that was a fun one. I, I anticipated that game all day, and we got drilled. <laughs> I went. To, I, I, mean, was sitting, I was on the front row. That was when I was in school. So another another reason why I'm big on the NIT experience. It's a little different for like kids now because you know when I went to my NIT game, I, K State had never played in the postseason, so it was like yeah, this, it was fun and exciting to be like you thought you were at a game of like high quality. Like I was a third grader, like God. <laughs> NIT against Vermont. This is peak basketball right here. This is fun. Uh, but like that was an enjoyable experience to, to get to be able to go to a game like that, which obviously like as a nine-year-old, it's not like my dad would have taken me to an NCAA tournament game. So uh, that was good. And I, I would, I still up until last year uh, where I guess I have to say that Kentucky game now uh, that, that NIT game against Vermont was easily the most fun I'd had in person at a basketball game. So uh, the NIT can be fun. And the unfortunate part is this is the kind of team that can make the NIT not very fun. Uh, so we'll just cross that bridge when we get there. If you want to be optimistic, don't eat, don't say that, Drew. I mean, I was going to. You said you said when we get there. I'm saying if we get there. They're making it to the NIT. I mean, that, <laughs> unless you're unless you're going to say what I was going to say is, well, forget the NIT. This team's going to be an NCAA tournament. What have we just spent all this time talking about? There we exactly. go. There we go. All right. Well. Uh, you all can play NCAA, NIT, or nothing in your car or in your living room right now. <laughs> and if you're like, these guys are stupid, NIT, screw that. Just keep saying NCAA, baby. Uh, and that all starts if K-State can beat Texas on Wednesday. So we'll see you in Kansas City. Uh, if you can't be there, tell your boss that they need to let you go because it, you know it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of basketball. So uh, go experience it and then have a blast up in KC. And you probably won't see us because we'll be lurking in the dark of the hockey press box <laughs> up there 
Thank you, Brett. Uh, no, but no, the, they'll see us at the concession stand getting all of our foods. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll I'll just put out a time schedule when I'll be there, and uh, all you loyal KSO listeners can buy the food for Drew and I. So that's how we're going to do it in Kansas City. Uh, we're crowdsourcing our meals. Uh, we're out of here for KSU underscore fan Drew Galloway. I'm Mason Voth, and we'll talk to you again later this week.